রাজুল দা শুনতে পাচ্ছ প্রচুর আমরা তিনজন বেসিক্যালি ওই ন্যাশনাল সায়েন্স এর যে প্রোগ্রাম গুলো আমরা তিনজনই মোটামুটি অর্গানাইজ করছি আর কি তোমাদের কখন এখন কটা বাজে খুব ভোরে তো উঠতে হয়নি নিশ্চয়ই নাকি না খুব সকালে না এখন এই সাতটা সাড়ে সাতটা আমাদের এখন পজিটিভ এই ঘোরাঘুরি না এখন পজিটিভ নয় নেগেটিভ আছে এখন মাইনাস থ্রি এখানে ঠান্ডা শীতকালে অনেক ঠান্ডা পড়ে যায় মাইনাস পঁচিশ তিরিশ অব্দি নেমে গেছে মাইনাস থ্রিটা এমন কিছু নয় আচ্ছা আমি একটু স্লাইডটা শেয়ার করে নিই দেখি সব ঠিক হচ্ছে আচ্ছা ফুল স্ক্রিন হয়েছে কি এবারে মুভ করছে ডুপ্লিকেট <laughs> 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 ডুপ্লিকেট না হয়নি এখনো ধানবাদ 
So uh, today we'll have, we have uh, Dr. Rajivur Islam. Uh, so uh, he, he's working in University of Waterloo, uh, in Canada. So his field of working, working field is experimental quantum information, quantum optics, and so on. He will get to know more, more about this today. Uh, so a big background about him is that he has uh, completed his bachelor's from Jadavpur University in West Bengal. And then he moved to uh, TIFR in Mumbai for master's. And after spending, I mean, after master's, he moved to uh, University of Maryland, US, where he did his PhD in experimental uh, quantum information and quantum computing. And then he, he moved to uh, Harvard, uh, Harvard University and MIT for postdocs. So there he was around five, six years in MIT and Harvard, both of them. And then uh, since 2026, he's an assistant professor at University of Waterloo uh, in, in Canada. Uh, so his, his topic today is the simulating the quantum world with laser-cooled trapped ions. So with this uh, small introduction, uh, I invite Professor uh, Rajibul Islam to continue his speech. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. OK, let me share my screen now. Do you see it or no? You don't. No, yes, sir, uh, not yet. What about now? Yeah, now it's fine. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much. So, <clears throat> uh, thanks for this invitation and uh, the National Science Day celebration. It's uh, uh, I'm very excited to talk about some research work that's going on at University of Waterloo, but. As Rithik mentioned, that I should give this talk at a very introductory level. So um, this, so that's that's how I have done. There is uh, only one equation in the whole talk, and that equation is the Schrodinger's equation. So hopefully we are all comfortable with that. So first of all, <clears throat> the picture that you are seeing on the screen. This is a picture of a few individual trapped atoms. And each blob of light that you see here is coming from a single atom for real. This picture, I'll give you more detail later on, but this picture is taken by a very simple camera, which is pointing towards the center of a uh, vacuum apparatus, ultra high vacuum. And inside that vacuum, we have these few atoms, about 18, I think, here. These atoms are just levitated inside the vacuum. They are very cold because we use lasers to cool them. And the temperature reaches very close to the absolute zero temperature. Okay, The temperature of these, these atoms are, I would say they are sub millikelvin. And at that temperature, the atoms really don't have much kinetic energy, so they essentially get stuck. And that's what we are seeing. So this talk is going to be about these trapped ions. And I will try to motivate how we can use these individual atoms, or ions in this case, to learn more about the quantum physics, about the quantum world. So that's what the title says, simulating the quantum world simulating through these ions. So these ions are like your computer program that you use to simulate another phenomenon <clears throat> with laser cool trapped ions. And uh, I have broken down with my talk into a few sections. So what would be great is if you could ask me questions after each section. So I will pause and I will invite questions. The only caveat is I'm not seeing the Zoom window, so somebody please uh, translate those questions if they come in chat for me. 
So I would uh, probably run out of time and therefore let me um, <clears throat> acknowledge all the uh, uh, group of the people who work uh, with me, postdocs and very talented postdocs and graduate students and everyone. And also, you know, without funding, nothing will happen. This is uh, one of the buildings, Institute for Quantum Computing, where I work. Institute for Quantum Computing is an interdisciplinary center at the University of Waterloo. And my affiliation is through the Department of Physics and Astronomy. But IQC itself has affiliations with seven departments. So let's talk about quantum. Um, I was told that everybody had one course of quantum, so I don't need to motivate you too much. But let's talk about a very general thing. This is a you know picture of the you know famous or uh, miserable cat called Schrodinger's cat, and the cat is in a superposition of being alive and being dead, or you know awake and sleeping. And whether the cat is alive or dead depends on the state of another, an atom, in this case a radioactive atom. And this is a this is a paradox, the Schrodinger's cat paradox. And the paradox is that we don't observe a cat being live or dead in real life, but in quantum mechanics, this is definitely a possibility. Okay. So let's not talk about cats because they are too big. They are macroscopic objects. Let's go to very small objects, such as a quantum spin. A spin is you can think of electrons having a spin half. Uh, this is an internal orientation of its magnetic field or an electron orbiting. It can have an orbital angular momentum and that can be quantized in any direction. So for quantum mechanics, there are two rules. <clears throat> As we know, this is just a recap. Uh, there, there, is, there is a set of rules when we don't look at the object, the quantum system, and there are rules where we look at the quantum system. So the first one is the superposition that if we have a simple quantum system, the so-called two-level system, that means a quantum system that can have only two states, zero or one, you can call it down or up or you know, head or tail or whatever name you want to give it, that's fine. The system could be in a superposition of those two states, alpha zero plus beta one, where alpha and beta are complex coefficients. The complex numbers are needed to explain interference experiment like double slit experiments with electrons and they have to be normalized and all so the idea is they must be in a quantum superposition but that's not all there is um, the second set of rules that's the measurement rule which means <clears throat> when we try to measure in this basis zero and one then the system collapses to one of them and we do not know beforehand which one it would collapse that's completely random, but the number of times it will collapse if we repeated the experiment many times is proportional to the probability, which is proportional to essentially the mod of this coefficient square, right? So these are essentially the two rules for quantum mechanics. Now, let me be clear about what I mean by measurement. So, Measurement doesn't necessarily mean that an experimentalist or you know, a human being, an observer, human being observer is measuring. Measurement can happen if anything in nature, and that could be you know, a photon flying through my vacuum chamber, which I did not send from a laser, but the photon is coming from some stray deflection from somewhere. If that photon interacts with my quantum system, and let the system reveal the which path information or which state information, then uh, that is considered measurement. Okay, so I don't have to actively monitor the outcome of this measurement process, but if an interaction happened, and in principle the state of the system is leaked onto the environment, then that is considered a measurement in quantum physics. So you can understand that as the system gets bigger and bigger, going all the way to a big you know, cat, the number of ways the system can interact with the environment goes up in the number numbers of degrees of freedom, right? And so, so that's where keeping a system quantum in a laboratory is very hard as the system gets bigger and bigger and very hard for a long time. And that brings us to the concept of 
decoherence time or you know coherence time sometimes people call it and essentially what that is is if you take a quantum system typically what is the time scale within which the quantum system is actually quantum that means it has not been accidentally measured by the environment typically the decoherence times you know range from uh, picoseconds or nanoseconds for big real solid state objects all the way to hours for individual isolated uh, atoms so that's just a general overview or uh, recap of quantum mechanics so now when i say simulating quantum world i don't mean a single quantum object i mean now we put multiple quantum objects together such as the same spin half system now let's put you know one and then two and then three and go all the way up to very large numbers for example 40 spin half objects together and now we see something very interesting happening because of quantum superposition there are exponential number of possibilities that can coexist in a quantum system for example if i have three spin half objects there are eight possibilities and in general the state of the quantum system is going to be a coherent superposition with these complex coefficients of all these eight possibilities so by the time i reach 40 spins i am dealing with 2 to the 40 which is a huge number of superpositions so just to write down the state of a 40 spin system you need to have that many complex numbers and then we know about entanglement if we look at these states the superposition states in a quantum system many of the states in fact most of the states are what is known as entangled states meaning the state cannot be partitioned or as a product of individual particles right so the first one up up plus up down plus down up plus down down is a product of the first particle being in up plus down you have to normalize one over root two and the second one being in up and down but if i look at this particular state you cannot write it as a product state what that means is when you are dealing with such entangled systems either in theory or in experiment you cannot afford to disregard the correlations between these two objects right and these are non-classical correlations meaning if i look at the first one it's up the second one is down first one is down second one is up and for this particular example uh, it's a singlet state so these correlations survive in any measurement basis okay but the point is quantum states are complicated where you cannot make simple approximations often especially when the system is entangled okay now here's my schrodinger's equation so what's the problem in a general quantum many body system the problem is you'd like to understand how the system evolves in time right for example let's say you know how individual spins or these you know tiny atoms they interact with each other that means you know you know what is the hamiltonian function that's the energy with which it interacts with each other let's say you know that and you want to predict if you initialize the system in a given initial state what the state will be at a later time right so that you can you know understand nature of quantum objects nature of quantum matter and how they evolve and general questions fundamental questions like that now if you want to do it using uh, math then you would be using schrodinger's equation assumes the whole system is coherent and there is no external measurement if there are measurements then you will follow in a more general time evolution prescription so what is the schrodinger's equation it's essentially a differential equation in the quantum state but see this is a deceptively simple equation because even if this looks like one equation it's not and the reason is the quantum state psi as we saw two slides back is a superposition of exponential number of possibilities quantum states so this equation is really a set of nested differential equations and the number of those individual equations are scale exponentially with the system size okay so that is the problem with dealing with schrodinger's equation so you can solve it you know on your paper or on your laptop for a few spins but by the time you go to 30 to 40 two level quantum systems then the number of equations became just so large 
that it is impractical to be able to solve such systems on any machine, any supercomputer, or a laptop, of course, but supercomputers as well. So, uh, so let's take a simple example. Let's say you are given by a problem, um, and the problem is we have you know this bunch of spins, and there is a model. Uh, this model, so that means there is a Hamiltonian which leads to the time evolution. The Hamiltonian has uh, the x components of those spins. You know, this is a spin half object, so it can have x, y, and z components. So the Hamiltonian has the x components interacting with each other. Maybe the spins like to align uh, if j is negative. Maybe the spins like to anti-align if j is positive. The so-called ferromagnet and anti-ferromagnet interactions. And maybe I also, to make the problem a little more complicated, I add a magnetic field, which is trying to flip all the spins along y direction. Okay, This is the so-called uh, transverse field Ising model, one of the simplest quantum models you can think of, of quantum interact of interacting particles. So let's say the problem is I want to simulate uh, this spin network, this bunch of spins, where spins are interacting with each other, in half objects under this Hamiltonian, how it evolves in time. That's what I want to know. How would you solve this problem? So first you will you know, open up your computer, open a programming environment, and then each spin, the state of each spin will encode in a classical memory. You will say the spin could be one or zero, but then, um, but because it's quantum, you need really need a complex number, that alpha and beta to encode each spin. And then after you have done that, you will write down the Schrodinger's equation, those nested differential equations in to the uh, in you know however many degrees of freedom you have a couple of complex coefficients you have those exponential of them and then you will solve schrodinger's equation you will use some kind of solver differential equation solver and eventually when uh, you have reached the desired time at which you want to observe the state of the system you would be uh, reading the uh, state of the complex coefficients from your differential solver differential equation solver, and you will compute probabilities using, let's say, Born's tool, a mod of the square, and you know different prescription that you, you have learned from quantum mechanics. So uh, of course, the hard part is the time evolution. Encoding is hard, but time evolution is the hard part, as I described. Now, I should also mention that there are many quantum many body theorists who actually don't do this. They find, depending on the problem, they find clever ways to approximate the problem into simpler problems where you don't have to deal with the full entanglement in the system and then you can approximate the quantum state by other simpler states that have some entanglement but not uh, so much entanglement that you have to deal with all this exponential number of basis states okay and there are <clears throat> there's a whole field of research many body um, theory approximations that deal with this, such as matrix product states. So let's bring in quantum now. In 1982, Feynman wrote this very influential paper. It's like a concept paper. And Feynman was asking this very simple question, can physics be simulated on a computer? Now, by the time people are already using computers, they are using computers as simulators, as you do <clears throat> now. Feynman was asking a more uh, a deeper question that if we wanted to simulate all physics, including quantum physics, can we do that on a computer? And back in those days, there was no concept of quantum computer. So when Feynman said computer, he of course meant our normal, <clears throat> meant our normal classical computer. And Feynman pointed out this problem of exponential number of uh, basis states for quantum system. But then he proposed an idea, and his idea was let the computer itself be built of quantum mechanical elements which obey quantum mechanical laws. So, so idea is as follows, right? Go back to our previous problem. The challenge for uh, us, why we have to deal with this exponential number, is because our classical computer and the registers, all the memories on the motherboard, <clears throat> they don't understand Schrodinger's equation in a native way. Because these are classical objects, those transistors, those are essentially classical objects. And that's why we have to deal with bits. So Feynman said, why don't we make a new computer where the processing itself is being done not by classical transistors, 
but by quantum objects, for example, atoms. Then I don't need to teach my computer laws of quantum physics because it is quantum. And that was the idea that Feynman proposed in the form of a quantum simulator because he was thinking of simulating nature. So uh, several decades later, quantum simulation and in general quantum computation is a thriving field of research now. And as you, you know, clearly you cannot miss this. There is so much buzz, so much hype about the field of quantum computation. There's a lot of industry, investment, uh, people like us building systems in research labs, but then also companies, government, everybody is trying to pursue this very complicated goal of achieving or realizing a quantum computer or a big scale quantum simulator. <clears throat> what would a quantum simulator be useful for? That itself is a field of research. And people from physics, computer science, applied mathematics, and many other departments, they all you know, study this problem. So far, there are a few uh, application areas where we believe that quantum computer would be very useful, or a quantum simulator at least would be very useful. In general, <clears throat> anywhere, any place where you have a bunch of quantum objects interact with each other, right? For example, chemical reaction. This is where quantum computer would be useful. Uh, a very practical problem is nitrogen fixation problem, which leads to the farty fertilizer and uh, just energy production in general. So maybe if we understand those chemical reactions better, we should be able to optimize the nitrogen fixation problem. In physics, let's say you want to understand the phase diagram of a many-body quantum Hamiltonian, which leads to all sorts of things like you know material physics, which leads to understanding of uh, high energy physics, then a quantum simulator may be useful. And finally, the hope is once we have systems that are complicated enough and powerful enough that we understand the basics of these Hamiltonians or quantum models, we can use those systems to eventually predict how to build new materials, you know, how to tweak the interactions at a microscopic level such that when we add many such atoms then um, or start building a system, a big system, it will have a wonderful property that we cannot produce now leading to batteries and possibly some you know, new drug molecule discovery and all. So that's in the future. It has not been realized yet, but these are kind of field of active research. So how would a quantum computer work? Just let's do a summary of that. So I still have the same problem. I have a bunch of spin networks and the problem statement is that I want to find out how these quantum spins evolve according to some Hamiltonian, some interaction Hamiltonian with external fields and all. So instead of encoding the problem on my computer, I still need a computer because I need to instruct the quantum computer. What I do is <clears throat> I trap, in this example, in my example, I trap a bunch of atoms, individual atoms, inside an apparatus. And those are individual atoms. The number should be uh, same or more than the number here of the problem size. Now I need to choose the atom wisely such that I can use two energy states or you know two states inside that individual atom as my two qubit states, zero and one. Okay, but this is quantum, so I can create a superposition. And then somehow I need a way to simulate the Hamiltonian. That means physically I need to create, I need to turn on the Hamiltonian, the same Hamiltonian as my problem Hamiltonian in this system. And how we do that, I will give you a few very simple examples later on. But that's the time evolution part. And note that this is the difference between the classical way of simulating and the quantum way of simulating. In classical way, I had to solve the Schrodinger's equation. Here, I don't need to solve the Schrodinger's equation by myself because the object that I'm using to compute or simulate is quantum itself. So it understands Schrodinger's equations natively. And then finally, when, I, when I'm done, rather than computing probabilities from my classical um, states before, now what I do is I observe this quantum state. So I measure. In these uh, system of atoms or ions, we can tune our laser beams in such a way that if after measurement, the projected state is up, you know, it's a quantum, so up or down. If it's up, then that atom will interact with my laser beam, the detection laser beam, 
and it will fluoresce. And if it's in down, <coughs> it will not interact, it will not fluoresce. So as a result, I can take just a snapshot of these atoms. And for example, a snapshot could look like this, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark. And that tells me that in that particular instant, the quantum state that the system reached is up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, or some kind of antiferromagnetic uh, option. But of course, this is quantum system, so I need to repeat it many, many, many times, and I need to average uh, to find the probabilities or compute the probabilities, okay? So this is how a quantum simulator works. You have a problem, encode in a real system, find a way to simulate the time evolution using you know, lasers and all, I'll talk about that. Let the system evolve on its own measure. Repeat, find out the answer. So this is the last slide of my first section before I invite questions. There are, <clears throat> there are many hardware platforms which have been um, used over the last decade or so, or almost you know, 15 years, 15, 20 years now, to uh, simulate various Hamiltonians. I'll talk about the trapped ions, which is one of the leading platforms of quantum simulation, and the neutral atoms <clears throat> could be bosons, fermions in optical potentials or optical lattices. Uh, <clears throat> nowadays, there is a lot of work with Rydberg atoms where you can individually move individual atoms. Photonic networks in solid state, there could be defects, superconducting systems, and um, you know there are many other systems that I did not include, molecules, a very recent and exciting development. So these are all quantum systems that can be used to solve different kinds of quantum problems, all right? So with that, let me pause and let me uh, see if there are general questions on the general idea of, of quantum simulation. And as I said, I cannot see the Zoom, so somebody can, if somebody can help me, that'll be great. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any questions on this? Yeah, please come in. There is one question. Yeah, go on. You can also ask that. Over here, that's also there. You can sit there and ask that. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much for your talk until now. I just have one question regarding superposition and how the mechanics uh, of qubits is working inside. So like uh, my question, I like frame it uh, formally is when the particles, you measure the part, uh, a qubit state, it will essentially review one of the eigen state. The information of only one is uh, when you take the measurement. So it's essentially like tapering, uh, we would seem to be no better off than if we use a classical computer and try it out with mm -hmm. random possible solution. So I, I think that uh, entanglement or the constructive interference and destructive interference is playing some role in here. Could you please elaborate the mechanics of how that is working? Yeah, yeah, no, this is indeed a very important question. Thank you for asking. So. Uh, I'll give you, first I'll give you a very simple answer and give you, maybe I'll give you a little bit nuanced answer. So the simple answer is, uh, you are correct. If you have, <clears throat> uh, if you just measure it once, for example here, the moment I shine my measurement beam, I get one projection and that's one instant, right? And that doesn't tell me much, it tells me one possibility. So as an experimentalist, what I need to do is I need to repeat the experiment many, many, many times to find out the probabilities of all these coefficients, complex coefficients. So <clears throat> you, you don't win in terms of time from a measurement point of view. Like you basically pushed your complexity of time evolution into a measurement complexity here, and you need to repeat, and the more complex the system is, you need to measure many times as such. To make the problem even more complicated, maybe you are interested not only in the z components of the spin as in here, but you are also interested in knowing the full wave function. So that means your measurement has to be done in exponential number of bases, which is a challenge. So and that can still be done. So what you do is after time evolution, you send another control laser beam, which rotates the measurement basis, and then you send your measurement beam. So if you, for example, if you rotate all of your measurement without measuring, if you rotate all of your block vectors, if you're familiar with that, by 90 degrees in the proper direction, 
then when you then measure your measuring spins along x direction for example and then again you repeat and <clears throat> you build up the quantum state so this could be very expensive depending on the problem and you have you are dealt with another exponential problem even here so you are absolutely correct so the nuanced answer is which one is harder is the time evolution harder or is this measurement harder and that uh, that answer depends on the problem itself right so in general and maybe this is what you are leading to there is the question of quantum advantage in general so the question is if i have a quantum algorithm in like for quantum computation or more restricted version of quantum algorithm specific to hamiltonian evolution let's say then if i compare the best possible classical algorithm which still uses which still has this exponential problem in the evolution and then the quantum algorithm which doesn't have problem there but of course how do you make use of all this interference and entanglement into the quantity that you want to measure so these two systems have two different problems then whether my quantum system still gives you a win or advantage and another word for it people use although now just don't, people don't use that anymore is quantum supremacy so supremacy or advantage um, compared to classical and that itself is a huge uh, problem in in the field like it's a research problem in the field so far the hint is that if you have some complicated you know quantum simulation problems for example you know your spins are interacting with anti-ferromagnetic interaction so there is a lot of competition things like that uh, <clears throat> then possibly for at least you know a, a decent enough size a uh, quantum simulators will get to uh, the answer for some questions maybe not all questions uh, possibly faster than classical machines um, but in general whether for a quantum algorithm your quantum system will give an advantage or not in general that's a very hard problem to uh, show right so far we know uh, how many problems so one problem that we know where quantum system clearly has an advantage is the factorization problem Schwarz algorithm and then there is another one the search algorithm if you want to search through a database unstructured database for example you want to find out you know the address of a house from a list uh, and use a quantum machine cast the problem in the form of a quantum algorithm uh, then that problem has a square root advantage how many times you have to do it compared to a classical there's a square root of n advantage uh, over there so um, but in general you're absolutely right this is a complexity problem in practice when we have an experimental system we just re repeat the experiment many times to solve this measurement problem but whether the time taken to do that is going to be even more complicated than the actual classical that is still a research problem it depends on the problem itself does that answer your question yeah thank you sir i have one more follow-up question uh, on deep yeah. learning on the idea of deep learning it's like uh, why is is the idea of deep learning uh, linked with like keeping qubits at below uh, microservering temperatures as in when you uh, we see uh, superposition effects in a double slit experiment but we do not see uh, like we do not need to constrain it to such stringent environments to see the interference pattern however when you like trap electrons to make qubits uh, you need to uh, put them in below kelvin temperature <laughs> what's the idea over there yeah so the difference is uh, so decoherence um, it it means simply put decoherence means <clears throat> you are controlling your classical world to the best you know, possible scenario for the examples that you uh, proposed for uh, classical waves such as light when you are observing interference uh, i would say even that is fragile you know if you build an interferometer and uh, somebody next to that interferometer is you know dancing talking loudly you'd see the effect of the interferometer you will see the interference moving or it could even be air current right that affects it so essentially all of those disturbances change the phase of one part of your interferometer compared to the other part of the interferometer and that leads to fluctuations so now you can take that classical uh, fluctuations into quantum regime where now i am talking about a very very fragile object a single particle and the single particle is very fragile it's the temperature is extremely low and why we need to go to that low temperature is because 
we want to observe quantum, right? We are talking about a superposition of a single massive object. And so therefore the temperature is important there. Otherwise, this, uh, just the thermal motion particle will be moving around everywhere and that's not a quantum superposition. So that's why you need to maintain low temperature. <clears throat> if you use photons, uh, photons are massless objects. So, you know, so they don't really respond to that temperature the way atoms respond. But again, we still have the same problem. The phase of the photon can be impacted by, let's say, air turbulence, right? Or heating up of a material if the photon is propagating through a crystal, for example. So, so the point is decoherence means accidental, decoherence can mean many things. Any, basically anything that deviates from perfect quantum laws, that's decoherence. So it could be accidental measurement, as I pointed out. It could also be your environment is fluctuating. So short to short, the conditions for the experiments are not reproducible, such as your temperature. There's a finite temperature, large temperature, so the atom is moving around. So sometimes you're seeing interference from an atom which was here with this velocity, sometimes from another point at different velocity. And when you average all of them, then you get an averaged effect, which is not a quantum effect. So decoherence en encompasses all of these. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you, sir. So in a sense, uh, we need to know uh, the context of our measurement. In Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would... Uh, I'll show a few pictures near the end when, you know, we experimentalists, when we talk about quantum, we actually don't, and we research on quantum, 95% of our time in the lab is controlling classical and not quantum. You know, we don't go to the lab and we start discussing quantum phenomena. We start discussing, you know, how to make temperature constant, how to cool the atoms and how to control, you know, currents, re reduce magnetic field noise. That's what we do 95% of the time. Yeah. So I have a couple of slides. So thank you for the question. Let me move on. How much time do I have? Do I have another 10 minutes or so? Yeah, maybe 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'm an experimentalist. So let me show you some pretty pictures, real pictures. OK. Uh, how do we trap ions? Ions are charged. So that means you know the hint is you can use some um, uh, voltages to trap ions. From very basic electrostatics, you cannot confine a charged particle in three dimension using electrostatics alone. Think about this because, you know, your Laplace equation has to be satisfied creating, you know, by any potential. So you, you need something more than static voltages. You need, uh, in this case, what we use is a combination of static and oscillating voltages or AC voltages. So this is a very simple ion trap that my undergrad students built. And this is now used as an undergrad lab at uh, University of Waterloo. So the idea here is this, you take four razor blades, they're at an angle, so you can kind of see the angle like forming an X essentially, and there's a little bit of open, a gap near the center. And then you take two conductors, these are simple banana plugs, banana clips, which we uh, put from the side, and then we turn on some voltages. We hook up some voltages, so these end caps, these are called end caps because coming from the end, they uh, get positive voltage, and these uh, blades, they get AC voltage, Basically, basically your wall voltage, right? 50 hertz in India, 60 hertz in Canada. And we amplify that voltage and we uh, hook them up. And that essentially creates an ion trapping potential inside, a confining potential in all three dimensions for charged particles of you know, specific mass and charge ratio. But if you have that right, it's a confining potential. So what you see, you know, these bright objects, these are actual dust charge charged particles or dust ions. We take some dust, like, you know, like a podium dust, or you can even take uh, uh, take coffee and, you know, finely grained coffee, and then you can charge it up by just rubbing it against some cloth, and then you drop them, and they just get stuck there. So that's an ion trap, right? You can do it in your lab or just as a hobby. A more formal version is this. You have four rods, or these rods could be different shape. In our case, these are blades, but four conductors. <laughs> You apply oscillating voltages at the end caps so that the charged particles don't leave from the ends. Positive charge because it's positive voltage, positive charge. And uh, that basically forms um, an ion trap. You can see an ion trap in action here. So this is a video. Look at that. So what you're seeing is the ions inside, they are, they are not like dead, right? Because they are kind of moving. You can see some of them is actually moving with large trajectories. But they are overall stuck here. 
and they're moving because it's in an oscillating field. So there's still some dynamics there, but on an average, it's a trap. And those particles are just levitated there. If you search on YouTube how to make iron trap at home, you will see lots of lots of you know fun videos. I don't have time to you know go through all of them. I'll just uh, look at this. So this is just two spoons. They are essentially grounded, and then you you have one loop, and that loop um, is hooked up to this wall voltage. Be careful of high voltage. And, uh, and you can create a charge particle here. So do a YouTube search and you can watch them. Um, if, if you can make a blade trap like that, like what you know I have shown in my previous slide, you can have very complicated ion traps. Um, again, these are not atoms, just normal dust particles. And uh, let me forward, you see? All these particles you are you know, forming from the top, you're dropping those particles, and then they are you know, just trapped here. And they're moving because the person who is demonstrating is changing the voltages of the electrodes. So you can make those particles dance. You can bring new particles. And uh, when you have a lot of particles, you can even create classical collective phenomena because the part, there are so many particles and they are dragging the air between them and that can create to a tornado. And uh, this is a... Uh, you know, this is called a trapanado, like a, a trap plus tornado. So essentially, it's a classical collective phenomena where you have too many charged particles and they're influencing each other because there's, you know, there's an air in this space and uh, they form like a tornado. Right? So there are lots of cool physics that you can do. And as I said, indeed, we built one such apparatus, which is now a undergraduate third year and fourth year uh, lab experiment at University of Waterloo now. So in our lab, uh, our trap is slightly more sophisticated because we want to trap individual atoms, right? And uh, and because this is individual atoms, so fragile, we have to protect them from collisions with background gas, right? If you look at the collision uh, frequency at normal temperature, room temperature, you're probably expecting a collision every picoseconds or so, right? even faster. So uh, we want to turn it down to a collision every... Maybe, you know, ideally, collision every you know many days, but maybe in practice, collision every uh, ten minutes or so, so that we have those atoms stay there at their place for many minutes, possibly hours. So we build this apparatus, these four rods. You can see, you can see from the side, right? These four rods and two needles, and we put all of that inside a vacuum chamber uh, and evacuate that chamber. I should also mention this. The picture of the trap that you are seeing, this is the first trap that we built in our lab a few years back. And this is the simplest kind of iron trap you can make called a four rod ball trap. Nowadays, there are uh, much more complicated traps, right? For example, this is another trap that we use for another of my of our experiments made by the Sandia National Laboratory in the States where uh, you have many electrodes. In fact, each gold connection connects to one electrode of the trapping region near the center. The electrodes are uh, micron scale, so they are tiny, tiny electrodes. There are 100 electrodes packed in this small space. The length scale here is, is about a centimeter here. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there could be very complicated lithographically fabricated electrodes for more control. And you want to hook them up to a vacuum chamber. So there is a lot of you know vacuum physics here. You need to you know know how to evacuate. And we go to in our experiment we go to low. 10 to the minus 11 millibar, which is 14 orders of magnitude lower than the atmosphere. And then uh, in this picture, <clears throat> now the lab is much more complicated. So I'm showing a picture from earlier when still you could see. So this is the vacuum chamber. You apply you know, whatever magnetic fields you need for creating um, you know, quantization axis and all for atomic physics. But then there is a, this black tube. You see there is a microscope objective inside the black tube, which is focused onto the atoms. And then the light gets bent from here and goes to cameras or photo detectors. That's where uh, we measure the signal from the atoms. So how do you, how do you uh, trap an atom in this system? What you do is you pick you know, what atom you want to work with. And in this example, we work with ytterbium. It's a rare earth metal. And we put just a little bit of ytterbium inside an oven. It's a tiny tube which has electrical connections to heat up. 
when we do, when we want to trap atoms from scratch which are non some current like few amperes and that increases the temperature uh, very rapidly because it's in, you know there's no dissipation from air it's in vacuum so the temperature goes to 200 300 degrees celsius in a matter of you know minutes and uh, at that high temperature the atoms start flowing in uh, it it skips the liquid phase it sublimates it goes the, all atom vapor and the oven is directed to the center. So some of the atoms are traveling through the center. These are still neutral atoms, very hot. We cannot trap them. Now we bring in two laser beams. Okay? One is a photoionization beam, which charges the neutral atom by knocking off its electron, uh, electron, the last electron. And now it becomes charged, right? As soon as it becomes charged, it starts seeing all that potential, trapping potential that we have created. And then there is a um, another beam uh, that cools atom. I will have one slide later on to show how a light can cool atoms, but this is, you know, one of my most favorite uh, discoveries of last century, laser cooling. So when you turn on both of these lasers, the atom, it's charged, it sees the potential, and it's cold, so it lost all of its initial kinetic energy, and now essentially it's trapped, it's stuck at that center. And remember, we have that objective from the top, essentially, you know, the vantage point of this picture, roughly, and we can look at something like this on the camera. On the camera, you know, atoms are arriving. This is a real-time video. One, two, three, four, five. You start popping individual atoms, right? How quickly you pop them, it depends on, you know, how, what, what your atomic flux is and the intensity of your ionization. So those are things that we can control. And we control them such that it's a, you know, from a human point of view, it's a controllable system. I can controllably trap let's say five atoms, because I want to do an experiment with five quantum bits, and then I just turn off my photoionization beam and atomic oven, and then I'm stuck with that five, right? So if you trap one or two ions, like one ion, it's so robust, the trapping, that you will almost never lose that one ion, right? We, it, uh, it lasts for many weeks, sometimes many months, that same ion, and you know my students get so attached to them that some of them you know, some of those ions get their own name. They started naming them because the same atom there for many um, weeks and many months. Okay. And this is taken with a very simple camera, CMOS camera, only a few hundred dollars, cheaper than your cell phone. Um, that's, you know, because of the camera technology, but also because these atoms are so cold, they're just there and they're scattering photons. So you just integrate for long, you know, few milliseconds or a few hundreds of milliseconds, depending on your requirement. All right, so I have uh, one slide to talk about how did the laser cool the at atoms or ions. If you're familiar with laser cooling, this will be a recap. If you are not, here's a hint. To do laser cooling, we use three basic physics concepts that you know all the students are familiar with here, I'm sure, and we put them together. So the first concept is atomic resonance. So if you have a laser, you send laser light, if I can tune the frequency of that light to be resonance between two energy states, then the atom will absorb that photon, okay? With some probability, but it will absorb that photon. So that's first concept, the resonance. Second concept is Doppler effect. The frequency of the light itself, this photon itself, depends on the velocity of the atom. And the third concept is that the photon not only has energy, but it contains, it carries momentum, and therefore it can give a kick and slow the atom down. Okay, these are three concepts. So resonance, okay, this is obvious. Now let's use Doppler effect. So let's say I deliberately tune my laser uh, at a slightly lower energy or lower frequency because energy and frequency are proportional for photons. So I tune my laser slightly at a lower frequency of light, but now that photon is not on resonance with the atom, right? Because the atom is resonance with this green photon, not the red photon. So the photon will just pass through and there's no absorption. The situation will change if I'm not talking about an atom at rest, but an atom that's moving towards the source. Because from the point of view of the atom, in that reference frame, Doppler effect will boost the frequency up. See, I deliberately turn the frequency down so that in the frame of the atom, the frequency will go up. And if I can do it properly, then it will go up by just the right amount to make it a resonant photon from the point of view of the atom. And then the atom absorbs. And when the atom absorbs, it got this momentum kick and then it slowed down just a little bit, right? And I repeat this many times. So in the long run, after it absorbed many, many, many photons, then the atom basically slows down. 
And that's essentially the trick of slowing down atoms, which is nothing but cooling my atoms, right? I reduce the kinetic energy. It's a very simplified version. If there are questions, I'll be happy to elaborate. Okay, so I am running out of time, but I want to show you a couple of quick slides on how to simulate a quantum model, the Hamiltonian that I showed. So I don't have time to go into detail, but roughly the idea is, again here, we deal with light matter interaction. Right? So in our field, the main kind of the core physics that we, <clears throat> that the atomic physicists like us, we learn and we apply in our day-to-day -day life in the lab is the light matter interaction physics. So if you have a cartoon example, you have this atom, <clears throat> and then if you take two laser beams that are pointing in opposite directions, then what the atom sees is the beat note between those two frequencies, nu1 and nu2. And I can control the individual frequencies to control the beat note, and that beat note can be controlled to address any atomic resonance that I care about. So uh, actually, let me skip this one. <clears throat> um, skip the animation here. But the idea here is if I have this two level system, if I have this two level, I call this you know spin down and spin up or zero or one, then I will tune my beat note between these two lasers such that the atom will undergo two level oscillation, right? Probably if you took a first quantum mechanics course, maybe you learned about two level oscillations, which that means the atom will coherently flop between the down and up and back and forth, right? So this is what we, sh we see here, two level oscillations. And from the point of view of quantum computation, essentially what we are doing for that single qubit or single ion, we, the ion is addressing all possible quantum states in the Hilbert space. As I vary how long the laser beams are on and interacting with the atoms, right? So if I know how to characterize each individual qubit state by you know, measuring, then that essentially makes what, what is known as quantum logic gate, right? So for example, if I turn on the atom, in this example for you know, whatever, 40, microseconds, then I create a gate which takes state 0 to 0 plus 1 by root 2, which is like a Hadamard gate. So, um, but from the point of view of simulation, essentially what's going on is that your uh, atomic spin, it precesses between two states. And that's much like if you have a classical spin apply a magnetic field, it undergoes precession or oscillation. So it simulates a magnetic field, right? So that's how we do it. Now, how you create interaction between two atoms is slightly more complicated, but the main idea here is that the, these are ions, charged particles, so they interact with each other by phonons or by vibrations, right? They repel each other and the trap is pushing them back, so there's a competition and there's a vibration, shared vibration. So if I can change the internal state of the first target spin, let's say, let's say this one, and I can choose my laser beam in such a way that it not only flips the spin state, but because light carries momentum, it also starts you know, shaking the whole crystal mechanically. And now the, another one, which I want you know, this atom to interact with, or this spin to interact with, it did not see the light, but it is still vibrating. So it knows something happened. And now I can send another laser beam, and I can control the frequency of the light in such a way that it will flip only if there was a vibration. So that means the second flipping is conditioned upon the first spin interacting with the light. And that is essentially a switch, right? That's essentially interaction between two spins. So this is a very simple cartoon picture of how we create spin-spin interaction, spin-spin entanglement. And again, there are several steps here. You can show, in effect, what you have created is a spin-spin Ising kind of interaction, Ising interaction, okay? And there are other kinds of interactions you can create. I'm gonna skip this slide, but just a Take home message here is because the spin spin interaction is not like static repulsion or something, but it's created, is mediated by these vibrations. In space, how spins interact with each other, it depends on the nature of that vibration. For example, if I choose a vibration, and I can choose that by controlling the laser light to be the center of mass collective mode where all the ions are vibrating with equal uh, eigenvector, then Effectively, the spin-spin interaction is also long range. It's ideally infinite range interaction, okay? And if I choose other normal modes, the spin-spin interaction takes the form of that normal mode. So by just choosing which normal mode I am allowing the system to uh, mediate the interactions between spins, I can control the shape of the interaction. And this gives a very powerful tool to us because we are not, unlike most real materials, where the interaction is completely defined by the geometry of the atoms, 
um, or mostly defined by the geometry of the atoms. Here we are not. Interaction is flexible. I can make long range interaction, short range interaction. Even I can make interactions that are completely arbitrary. So even if my atoms are in 1D space, the interaction looks like they're coming from a 2D square lattice or a Kagome lattice. How we program the system? Again, I'm skipping like many slides. How we program that? That could be a complicated problem. We can use machine learning and all um, to program those. But, but the take home message from here is that even though physically the ions are in 1D, the spin spin interaction is much more complex. And I can control them into arbitrary spin spin interaction. Okay. So these are my final, some uh, couple of parting thoughts. Um, there are you know, many students in the audience, <clears throat> even though I cannot see you here. But if you're thinking of you know, being a quantum mechanic in the future, I want to point out that quantum mechanics is or at least the experimental quantum mechanics is not only done from physics or computer science or mathematics point of view. Everybody or most people, no matter what you study um, at, at an IIT like this, you probably have an angle to enter quantum, the field of quantum, uh, quantum computation, quantum simulation. So for example, just in my own research, these are some of the skin, some of the skill sets that we use, physics, mathematics, mechanical engineering, mechatronics engineering, electronics, electrical engineering, optics, photonics, computer science, you know, vacuum technology, so all sorts of engineering. If you show you a couple of quick pictures, you know, this is a typical optics lab, right? I'm sure you have seen optics lab uh, at your institution. And uh, this gets too messy. You have too many mirrors and uh, lenses on posts, and then you have clamps. So when we started building these complicated systems, hardware, uh, we thought, okay, this is too fragile because it's you know, too many mechanical elements. So we, we hired mechanical engineering students and converted those into very clean mechanical blocks. Look at this. No clamps, no forks. You still have the laser and still have the mirrors. They are positioned on a custom CAD designed CNC milled monolithic breadboard, which has exactly the right slot for all the components. So my new lab actually looks like this. It doesn't have, it's not as it's still complex, but it's not as you know, messy. Other one, you have to deal with vacuum technology, clean room techniques, and uh, so with that, we built you know three machines in our system. One is functioning, uh, you know, pictures I showed you from this machine, and the two more complex machines, uh, one jointly with Crystal Senkos Group, for different atoms. Um, you will you'll hear more about them maybe later on, uh, later years. Finally, a bit about the comp uh, the computer science aspect of it. So once you build such a complicated quantum machine, how do you even control this, right? Uh, there is a whole layer of complexity, uh, both in terms of scientific complexity, technical complexity, but also you know, human complexity here, or social complexity. So for example, somebody, let's say you have some ideas to study some specific spin Hamiltonian on this system. So that means you are dealing with the quantum top layer where you are dealing with maybe some quantum gates or Hamiltonian, that's what you're dealing with. And you don't need to know how an ion, how ions are trapped. You don't need to know how I turn on my laser, how I control the laser. That's too much information for you. So a quantum operating system should be able to take your problem at a very high level and then translate it through various layers of abstraction where it breaks down the Hamiltonian into what it means for the atomic physics, like matter interactions. So it breaks down into so-called momer sorensen gate and all of those. And then eventually, operating system at the lowest level breaks down to instructions to my lasers, to my radio frequency oscillators, such that my real hardware can be controlled, right? And this whole operating system actually does not exist now, the whole integrated system. Some industry, they are working on it, but it's industry, of course, so they are copyright protected, mostly. Um, so in together with Professor Crystal Sink and Roger Melko at Institute for Quantum Computing, we have been developing such a full full stack quantum operating system so that in maybe hopefully in like two, three years time scale, you can run your ideas remotely sitting at IIT, ISM on our machine, right? Through cloud essentially. And you can control various layers of it. There are some commercial applications where you can already do that, but they are limited to what kind of problems you can study. This is a full open source research problem. Okay, so with that, um, let me stop with this final slide. There are many research problems that we are working on. I just highlighted three high-level problems. 
how much control can we exert over individual ions? A lot of our work is, you know, how much optical control we can put on those ions. Uh, what kind of many body physics phenomena, what kind of Hamiltonians we can study. So right now we are studying Floquet Hamiltonians, if that makes, uh, if that means anything to some of you, and then I'm sure it does. And then, you know, quantum phases, phase transitions, and then we play with different quantum simulation algorithms, you know, analog simulation, digital simulation, hybrid analog digital, hybrid classical quantum, and these are all, you know, these are all kind of mini research fields in their own rights. So, uh, so thank you. That's uh, that's all I have. And sorry for going a few minutes over time. Okay, thank you very much for this exciting talk and also very beautiful pictures and videos. So, thank you very much for that. So, uh, do you have any questions? Do you have any questions from the audience? Well, I don't see any questions from the YouTube, for example. Yeah, stop it. Yeah, this one. Please sit down. Uh, thank you very much, sir, Azreen, uh, for a very entertaining talk. Yeah. Uh, like, I just want to know there are so many uh, techniques to uh, make qubits, right? Uh, you can use ion traps as you are using. Uh, neutral atoms, red bug atoms, or even photons or electrons. Like, so is that also dependent on the problem or do you think like one of the techniques has an advantage over the other or is it completely problem independent then? It's not problem or, independent. Or is it um, a matter of... Uh, sorry to interrupt. What was the last one? Is it a matter of what? Is, is it a matter of choice? Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, if you, if somebody, any platform can build a fully error corrected quantum bit, error corrected meaning if there are small errors uh, from environmental perturbation or whatever, then your system can correct itself, the so called error correction. If uh, so called logical qubits. So, um, if a system gets there, um, I don't think other systems would be completely irrelevant, but that would be a point where you can say um, that, uh, you know, I can use this system to probably study any quantum problem, any quantum algorithm. But right now, we are far from that point. Every system that, you know, you talked about and I showed. <clears throat> they have their own problems, they have their own errors. Different systems are prone to different kinds of errors. So um, it's not exactly a choice at this point, but having said that, there are some platforms that are more developed than others. Trapped ions and superconducting platforms are, I consider them to be the most developed. Um, trapped ions have some huge advantages why, you know, there, there, there are many people working following this path. The biggest advantage in my mind is that you don't have to build the qubits. The qubits are nature given. You take two iterbium atoms, iterbium ions or two barium ions, or five or ten, and as long as you can control the magnetic field, you know, technically to a good extent, and that can be done, all the qubits are identical. They are energy states, they are spectrum, they are identical. It's a simple statement, but it's actually quite interesting because if you compare with man-made qubits, superconducting qubits or quantum dots and other things, every qubit is different. Right? They're, they're a little bit different. Right? Depending on your problem, whether that difference may be relevant, may be okay, but they are different. So this is a huge problem with atomic systems, that they are identical, they are nature-made. Another huge advantage, <clears throat> another huge advantage with the atomic system is that uh, they are, because they are atom, the tiniest uh, objects, it's and not like a solid state object, they are relatively easy to isolate. So I did not show this, but people have done uh, benchmarking experiments where you measure how long, this decoherence time, how long you can retain a quantum superposition in various memories. And for ions, that number, proven, demonstrated number is over an hour. And that is remarkable. That means you create a superposition of spin down and up, up plus down by root two, let's say. 
and then you know you go out do your quantum class and come back and that atom is still in the superposition there is no accidental measurement no coupling with the environment so you can isolate the system so robustly and any quantum matter coherence decoherence is really the biggest resource okay so that's another advantage in favor of the ions some challenges in uh, for ions is that ions are charged particles so if you want to put a thousand of them together that's a little bit challenging right because they all repel each other the physical system becomes big and and the consensus is that we are not going to build an iron trap that traps a thousand controllable particles instead we'll be building small modules of iron traps that are connected either mechanically mechanically meaning in one module iron trap you maybe trap 20 ions or 30 ions 30 qubits and then you can physically move one of them through like a rest track and go to another zone another ion trap and that's build up a big system or you can do networking with photons so you have again the small ion trap 20 30 let's say ions and then you entangle photons emitted from one of the ions with the rest of the ions and that photon goes to optical fiber and then connects another ion trap so you build up the system so there are ideas but how we uh, realize a large scale thousands and thousands of qubits in an iron trap computer that is a challenge if you compare with let's say superconducting system it's a fabrication system you can print a million although i should caution you that in popular media newspaper you would often see you know this company makes a two million qubit computer that's nonsense what that means is that they can build a chip where they can print two million that doesn't mean it's two million qubits because it's not a qubit until you show that all of this is coherent and you can control okay so but 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 regardless of that nevertheless it's easier for these fabricated technologies to even print a thousand whereas with iron you have to do a little bit of extra work of building this network of building it up so there are pros and cons of both systems but in terms of quality so far iron qubits are still the best in terms of you know demonstrated quality of the answers yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, have a good day. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, is there any other question? Okay. If not the case, then we thank the speaker again. And well, and uh, yes. yeah. And also, I I want to point out to the audience that uh, uh, I mean, uh, Professor Rajibul Islam. So I call him Rajibul. Actually, so he's my senior. So, uh, so Rajibulda is also organizing Biggan.org. Uh, so he's actually one of the founder of Biggan.org. So that actually, uh, you know, that uh, so that explains science in in Bengali language. To so he goes to schools and and uh, maybe Rajibulda, if you can, uh, maybe you can speak about it a little bit. Thank you, thanks, thanks, Siti, for bringing this up. Uh, this is one of my uh, weekend passions, you can say. So. Uh, Almost 10 years back, 2014, when I was a postdoc at Harvard, several of us, we decided to um, start this uh, initiative where we uh, write uh, modern research and modern technology, science research and technology in our mother language, which is Bengali. I'm from West Bengal. And um, so you can go to Biggan, B-I-G-Y-A-N, if you understand Bengali. I'm sure not everybody is Bengali here. But if you understand Bengali, B-I-G-Y-A-N, Biggan.org or Biggan.org.in, you can go through both. And um, we try to basically cover uh, lots of you know, interesting research areas. We you know, interview other people. Um, just the last week, we there is a, um, a two-part interview with Professor Mahadevan at Harvard. He does like wonders with simple stuff like origami and he understands geometry with that so it's all done in bengali and now it has gained a lot of momentum in bengal so for example we are reaching out directly to uh, many many schools and these contents are going straight to high school so uh, yeah this is kind of my weekend passion whenever i visit uh, home i uh, yeah i visit some school or some college and i interact with the students and uh, and and lastly i would say that one related content but not exactly began is um, you know, over the last five, six years at uh, Waterloo and Institute for Quantum Computing, we get many, many applications from students all over India, lots of IITs, ICERs. And uh, one general comment that I can give is that 
I see very few students from uh, uh, IITs and ICERs who are applying for the physics program, not engineers, physics program, they have very good hands-on research experience. So I can definitely say that uh, we need uh, not just an, any, I'm not talking about any specific institution, but in general, we need more uh, hands-on uh, research, experimental research, hands-on uh, tool sets, hands-on research. So this is also something that we promote through Beacon.org. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I can comment on that. Uh, so a so few days back, I was in my school, uh, which is in a remote village. And I, I mean, I was given a, you know, a document and a, and a book, and that book was actually printed version of this Beacon.org. So that was, uh, they're re reaching out to, to the schools, and uh, this is a very fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Bye.